Hi, my name is Gary Ginn, and I'm the pastor here at Redeemer Church in Titusville, Florida. And I want to start today just by saying uh, thank you for spending part of your day with us in worship today. And as you might have expected, Redeemer has made the decision to transition from our normal worship services at our facility on Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock to an exclusively online worship service. We're doing this, of course, because we're trying to do our part, being good neighbors, and trying to limit as much as possible the spread of the coronavirus. Now, this does make us really sad, primarily because Redeemer has this long and rich tradition of being a very warm and welcoming community uh, for both sinner and saint alike. And so we're going to miss the handshakes. We're going to miss the hugs. We're going to miss... Uh, the intimate worship environment that God has created here on Sunday mornings. However, uh, we're also grateful. We're grateful for technology. We're grateful for the resources. We're grateful for the volunteers who've sacrificed their time and their talent to be able to produce uh, this worship service that we're about to experience. And so my heart goes out to those guys and my thanks goes out uh, to those guys as well. I do have one housekeeping item, though, that I want to make mention of, and it's this. If you are on the Redeemer mailing list, uh, we sent out an email on Friday that had the order of worship. It had the the lyrics to all the songs that we're singing today. Uh, It had the prayers that we're going to be offering as well as the scripture passage that we're going to be looking at. And so if you haven't yet printed uh, those materials off, you can feel free to go do that right now. You can print that off and you can follow along with us uh, in the worship service. If you're not on our mailing list, I want to encourage you to just look at the contact information that we have here on our website and you can send us uh, an email or you can give us a phone call and we will be more than happy to add your name uh, to our email list and send those uh, materials, those resources off in the next week or so uh, as we continue to, to worship remotely um, uh, over the, for, uh, for coming, the upcoming weeks, I should say. One last thing. Uh, the Bible says, or the, the psalmist says, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Well, I can think of no better way than this day, this time right now, to bring our hearts before the God of all grace to sing, even in the comfort and safety of our own homes as we come and bow and worship to the great, our great God and King. So would you now join us in worship? Thank you.
Join me now in a time of confession. And if you have those words, just read along with me. Heavenly Father, time and again in your word, you promise that you are always with us. We confess that we don't always believe it. We confess that fear dominates our minds at times more than your promises. Father, forgive the weakness of our faith. So we ask you for your words of truth and power to strengthen us. Thank you for your goodness and for never leaving nor forsaking us. We look to you today, our Lord and Savior. It's your face we seek. Would you take now just a moment to silently confess before God? Now hear these words of assurance from Psalm 46, verses 1 through 3 and verse 5. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. Take and enjoy and savor God's assurance of salvation given to you.
Would you now bow your heads and your hearts with me in prayer as we come to the Lord together. Father, we bow before you. We bow before your power, your grace, and your goodness. Father, many of us are scared. We don't know what the future holds. We rarely ever do. But it's in times like this that our confidence is shaken. And so we confess our weakness to you right now. But we also confess, Lord, that you are our strength and our shield. We know nothing can separate us from the love that is in Christ Jesus. But Lord, help us in our unbelief. That is our prayer today. Calm our fears. Strengthen us in your grace. And walk with us, we pray. Jesus, as King, you have promised victory over all of your and our enemies. And help us now to trust you. Help us, Lord, to believe that in being in your good hands and in your powerful hands is enough. And so, Father, we love you and we praise you. We pray that you'll be with us in a few moments when we look at your word and that you'd speak to us. You love to speak to your children. And may we have ears to hear. We love you. Be with us now. 
And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Today's passage comes to us from John chapter 16, uh, verses 30 through 33. And today's message is entitled, as you might expect, Faith-Filled Living in Times of Global Chaos. But we're going to read God's Word together. And you should have that printed if you're on our mailing list. And this is God's Word, John chapter 16, beginning in verse 30. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. And Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Yet yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Let me pray for us right quick. Heavenly Father, we thank You for the riches of Your Word. And we pray that we'll be able to mine them today as we gather together around Your Word. And we pray, O Lord, through the power of Your Spirit that You would speak to us, that You would calm any fears that we may have. Father, that You would accomplish the purposes for which You're giving us Your Word this day. And so be with us even now. Father, forgive this man uh, his sins, for they are many. And I pray that Jesus and him alone would be glorified right now, even as we look at your word. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, it is an unprecedented moment right now in our history, isn't it? Schools are closed. Standardized testing has been canceled. I know my kids are absolutely excited about that, and I would imagine educators not so much. Restaurants uh, have had to, uh, they've had to cut their capacity in half or, or go to takeout service altogether. Bars are closed. And the reality is a lot of us are really scared right now, aren't we? We don't know what the future holds. We begin to ask ourselves the question, will we have jobs in a month? Can this virus be stopped or at least slowed significantly? Will someone we know and love um, get infected? Or even better yet, will I get infected? I mean, these are just some of the questions that we're asking ourselves today. But those questions aren't the sum total of who we are. They're not the sum total of who you are either. Because I too believe in Jesus. I trust in His goodness. I trust in His power. And so ultimately, I think the question should, that we should be asking ourselves in times like this is what does it mean to live a life of faith? What does it mean to live a, a faith-filled life in the time of global chaos. And I believe that actually Jesus answers that question for us today from the passage that we've just read out of John chapter 16. You see, the passage we read today comes from what is called Jesus' farewell discourse. Just before He was about to be betrayed by His good friend Judas Iscariot, just before Jesus was about to be taken away from His disciples and crucified upon a nail-stained or blood-stained cross, Jesus knew that the world was about to be turned upside down in the lives of these disciples. He knew that their equilibrium was about to be upset that they were getting ready to really be thrown off balance, much like the way we feel in connection with the coronavirus. You know, I've never washed my hands so much as I have over the past week or used as much hand sanitizer as I have over the past week. And so Jesus uses this time, this scary time, to prepare His disciples for what their future will hold, to give them some nuggets of truth that they can hold on to when their world is radically altered so they can live faith-filled lives. 
I think there are four things in this passage that can help us to live faith-filled lives in the face of global chaos. And I'm just going to, to, to list them off here, and then we'll spend a little bit of time unpacking each one of them. The first one is this. We should not be surprised or shocked uh, by this global pandemic, this global chaos that we uh, now find ourselves in. So that's one. Number two, peace in the midst of this chaos is actually possible in Jesus Christ. Three, chaos actually gives us an opportunity to show Christ's love to a world that's turned upside down. And four, lastly, this global chaos also gives us the opportunity to make some declarations about who brings life in the face of death. So let's start with the first one. Number one, this should not surprise us. Global chaos should not come as a shock or a surprise to us. I mean, look at verse 33, for example. Look at what Jesus tells His disciples here. Before He goes away from them, before they have the heartache and the heartbreak of the cross, look at what He says. He says to them, in this world you will have tribulation. You're going to have trouble. Jesus tells His disciples and He tells everyone subsequently who follows Him that life isn't always going to be a bowl of peaches and cream. The sun is not always going to be uh, shining on you. There's going to be rain sometimes. The wind is not always going to be at your back. You're going to have trouble. So what is Jesus referring to here? He's speaking actually of the fallenness and the brokenness of the world in which we live. You see, from the moment Adam and Eve lifted the forbidden fruit to their lips and rebelled against God and His revealed will, chaos and brokenness with God, with ourselves, with others, and even with creation itself has become the norm and not the exception. This is our normal. Trouble and chaos is the norm, not the exception. And that's what uh, COVID-19 or the coronavirus is. It is the result of creation's fault. It is the result of Adam and Eve turning in rebellion against God and His purposes. It is the result of creation's fall. Much like tornadoes and tsunamis, much like hurricanes and floods, it's as if creation itself is crying out for liberation. Listen to what Paul says in Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 19 and following. For the creation itself waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of Him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Do you see what Paul is saying? He's saying that sin, he's saying that breaking God's law has rippling effects. It's not just us in our own personal lives that are now estranged from God. It's not uh, just that we are sinners against one another. He says all of creation itself is broken. It has rippling effects and it hurts and touches everything around us. And so Paul actually has Adam, the first Adam in mind when he pins this. It was Adam whose transgression in the garden brought chaos to us all. Now, I suppose that that would be sad beyond belief if that were the end of the story. Uh, If all we were confronted with was this, that everything's broken, and so we should just buck up and get over it, that we should just quit our crying and moaning and resign ourselves to believe that things aren't going to get any better. But that's not the end of the story. I dare say that, that, but I dare say that, however, that that's a lot of where we are right now. That's where a lot of us land. 
a sort of nihilistic, fatalistic view of the world. But even in our passage that we read today from John chapter 16 and even from Romans 8 that Paul gives to us, uh, we have a different take on the situation um, than we might have imagined. Jesus in John chapter 16 says, But take heart, for I have overcome the world. Jesus says sin and brokenness. Jesus says fallenness does not have the last word. Jesus says, I do. Jesus says, I am the final word. And Paul in Romans chapter 8 says that creation itself groans, and it groans how? It groans in hope that it too will be set free from its bondage and its corruption. He too believes that sin and brokenness and fallenness doesn't have the last word. Jesus does. My dear friend, what stands at the heart of the gospel is a Savior who knows, a Savior savior who actually leaves the great Eden, heaven itself, the perfection of heaven. And He enters into the fallenness and the brokenness of this world and becomes even subjected to it. Why? Why does He do that? So he can heal it by his life and by his death and by his resurrection. That's good news. And so we should not be shocked or surprised when global chaos arises because we have someone who knows it all too well. We have someone who has entered it and someone who is also at the very same time healing it even as we speak. Prophet Isaiah says, by his wounds we are healed. And so Isaiah is talking not just about our lives that are broken, but he's also talking about the whole cosmos that is being restored and healed because of the work of Jesus. So let us not whimper and cower in the shadows as if this virus has won. Because Jesus is the one who is and has the final word. So that's the first point we want to make. And secondly, we can have peace in the midst of chaos through Jesus Christ. Look at verse 33 again. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. That's what Jesus says. You know, I'm part of a recovery group that meets on Sunday mornings here at the church. Uh... And at the outset of every meeting, uh, we get together and we say a prayer and we actually recite the 23rd Psalm together. And one of my favorite passages there in the 23rd Psalm is when David says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you're with me. I think a lot of us right now are struggling with peace in the here and the now. Maybe many of us believe the Bible. We believe what we read in Revelation chapter 21, for example, when it talks about the new heavens and the new earth, when it talks about Jesus coming down and the holy city of Jerusalem coming down and taking up habitation on the earth. We believe that when He comes back, He's going to wipe every tear from our faces, that there's not going to be any more sorrow or mourning or death anymore, that there's actually going to be peace. But most of us think that that peace is still in the distant future and not meant for us here today. And I'm here to tell you something radically different, something very, very different. That peace is available David in the 23rd Psalm, when Jesus here in John chapter 16 says, we can have peace now. We can have peace in the midst of our sufferings. That He walks with us in the sufferings. He's not promised just to deliver us from them. He has promised to be with us in the midst of them. In the midst of our pain. In the midst of the valley of the shadow of death. Now look a little bit more closely at John chapter 16, verse 33. What does it say here? I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. 
Do you see what Jesus is saying here? He's saying to experience peace, to experience wholeness, to experience flourishing, to experience harmony is to be in Him. We have to be united to Jesus in order to actually have peace in our lives. And that means that the antithesis is also true. That apart from Jesus, there is no peace. And so the question I think most of us need to be asking ourselves today is this. Am I in Jesus? Because if I'm in Jesus, I can have peace in the midst of of all this craziness. Here's a great way to understand if you're in Jesus. These are a couple of diagnostic questions that you may want to just ask yourself uh, in the quietness of your own home. Uh, After this uh, worship service is done and you have a time to reflect, these are some of the questions that you may want to ask yourself. Number one is this, does your relationship with Jesus supersede all of your other relationships? In other words, is it more valuable? Is it more precious to you than every other relationship? Another question to ask, uh, do God's Word and His promises melt your heart? Do they melt your heart? Does God's Word and promises, does it rearrange your allegiances? Does it rearrange your commitments? And here's the big one especially poignant for our day and time. Dear friends, does it change what you fear? If you fear this virus more than you fear falling into the hands of God, then, my dear friends, I hate to tell you this, but I have to, then you don't yet know Him. You are not yet in Him. But if you fear Him if you fear the destruction that He could bring upon you, but instead has chosen out of nothing but sheer grace and goodness and love to extend grace upon grace, upon grace on top of you and upon you, then guess what? You are in Him. Once again, the psalmist writes, Your loving kindness, O Lord, is better than life. Your loving kindness, Lord, is better than life. Friends, in Jesus today, right now, this very moment, whatever you may be feeling, you can feel peace wash over you. Let me encourage you then to come to Him. Let me encourage you to pray. Let me encourage you to trust Him with your life and every part of it. And He is the one who promises to give you peace. So that's point number two. Thirdly, So we should not only be uh, not shocked or surprised by this global chaos and the fact that we can also have peace in the middle of it, in the midst of it. Thirdly, this moment can actually give us an opportunity to show Christ's love to a world that's been turned upside down. You know, church history tells us this story in the early uh, church And particularly in the second century, plagues ran rampant throughout the Roman Empire. Many people, many Roman citizens left the stench and the smell of the decaying bodies uh, in the city. Many left the the decay and the, the squalor and death that were in the streets. They simply couldn't stomach it. Do you know who stayed behind to care for the sick? Do you know who stayed behind to grieve with those who were bereaved, those who had lost loved ones? Do you know who stayed behind, who risked both life and death to get the plague themselves and yet minister to those who were hurting? It was Christians. In the 4th century, the emperor Julian had these words to say, and I'll quote, Atheism, now, just so you know, in Julian's mind, in his view, Christians were equivalent to atheists because they didn't bow to the Roman God. So when Julian says atheism, he's really talking about Christians. But this is what he says. He has, says atheism or Christians 
has been specially advanced through the loving service rendered to strangers and through their care for the burial of the dead. It is a scandal that there is not a single Jew who is a beggar and that the godless Galileans, listen to this, care not only for their own poor, but for ours as well. They stayed behind. They risked life. They risked getting the plague so that they could show a dying world the beauty of Jesus. You see, from the very beginning of Christianity, deeds of mercy and love have been part and parcel of the Christian life. For those, uh, compassion for those who are hurting, pity for those who are grieving, deeds of mercy for those who find themselves at the end of their rope. When Christians stand shoulder to shoulder with them, this is what shines bright. It's Jesus. This is what the world sees. It's Jesus. This is what makes Christianity at least plausible for some because they're willing to live and they're willing to die for something greater than their own safety and security. So now is the time for us to stand too. Now is our moment. We have this opportunity in front of us to show tangible love to our neighbors. And I have a couple of suggestions for you. Number one, why don't you offer to get groceries or prescription drugs for uh, your at-risk neighbors? This is a great way to show tangible love, the love of Christ to your neighbors. How about preparing a meal and taking it to someone who's not doing well, someone whom you know is struggling, struggling struggling to believe in Jesus, struggling uh, to to put one foot in front of the, the next from one day at a time. Jesus says, Let your light so shine before others that they, just like Emperor Julian, might give glory to God because of you. And lastly... This moment is not only a moment of opportunity to let Christ's love shine, it's also an opportunity to make declarations. What is it that we all fear most? Right now, I fear taxes the most. It is tax season. But most of us fear death and taxes, not necessarily in that order. What we fear most really is death, all of us. We're afraid this virus might take someone we love. We may even be afraid that this virus might take us. Death is a universal fear. But dear friends, something greater, something far more powerful than death, something far more eternal than death has come. And it's Jesus In John 10, 10, Jesus says, The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, but I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. You see, in the face of death, Jesus offers life. That means that you and I have good news to share with all of those who are afraid in our circles. We can declare to those who are afraid that even death could not keep Jesus. The tomb is empty. and That He offers life to all those who are afraid. And that in the end, we shall stand upon the earth because our Redeemer lives. Friends, this is what faith looks like in a global chaos. It stares death in the face and says, Jesus beat you. And because Jesus beat you, I beat you too. So let us love and sing and wonder at God's indescribable love and power. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your promises that even though we may and will experience tribulation and trial in this life, Lord Jesus, you have overcome. You have overcome the world. You have overcome our biggest enemies in sin and death. You have rendered them powerless. And so, Father, we thank you 
because you have rendered them powerless, it means necessarily that because we're in you, we too are more than conquerors through him who loved us, that there is neither life nor death, there's neither power or principality, uh, there, there's nothing, not even the coronavirus, that would ever be able to separate us from the love that we have, that you have given us by nothing but sheer grace, the love that you have given us in Christ Jesus. And so, Father, fill us with faith. Father, if we're scared, enable us to merely confess that before you, to say, we're weak, but Jesus, you're strong. And so, Father, be with us now. I pray that you would take your words and only your words that you have given to us today and apply those to our hearts. And may we sing and love and wonder again at your indescribable power and love and grace in the face of Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Let us sing together now.
Thank you for joining us in worship today. I really do appreciate it, and I hope it came off well. Uh, this is our first try at, at this online business, but we do thank you for taking uh, the time to spend with us and to worship our great God and King together. Now, if you will receive God's good word, His benediction to you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn the very light of His countenance upon you and give you His peace both now and forever. And we love you. Go in Christ's peace. Amen.